From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Don Amici, Joan Bennett, and Claire Trevor in Border Town. Lux presents Hollywood. Border Town is the drama of a man's desperate search for power and position, and of the part two women play in his life. Filmed by Warner Brothers, Border Town stars Don Amici, Joan Bennett, and Claire Trevor. H.B. Kaltenborn, celebrated commentator, is our special guest. Louis Silvers directs our music. But before Mr. DeMille introduces our stars, here's a piece of news. Listen to it coming over the telegraph wires. Lux Radio Theater Hollywood. Fashion news. Scouts report biggest Luxable year ever. Stores feature Luxables. Women wear them in town, country, and at the world's fairs. And that's good news for women because Luxable clothes are not only smarter than ever, they're thrifty. Lux Flakes cut down cleaning bills. With Lux, you can keep fresh and dainty at almost no cost. And Lux, you know, cleanses so safely that clothes stay smart-looking longer. You can depend on the famous Lux promise, if it's safe in water, it's safe in Lux. And here's the producer of the Lux Radio Theater. Ladies and gentlemen, your host, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen, and my thanks for the many letters that have been coming to me this past week. You may remember that last Monday I answered a woman's question as to how she could show her appreciation of the Lux Radio Theater. My reply was, buy the products behind the Lux Radio Theater, Lux Flakes and Lux Toilet Soap. Many of your letters since then have told me of your loyalty and continuing purchases of these products, both for their own sake and for the sake of the entertainment they make it possible to bring you each Monday night. Thank you for this friendly response. Some 200 miles southeast of Los Angeles, just over the Mexican line, is the border town of our play. In such towns, you'll find many men and women who've chosen to forget the past. One of these men, who fled the world he had known to start life again in a border town, is the subject of our play, which brings a brilliant trio to us, Don Amici, Joan Bennett, and Claire Trevor. No other group of stars more perfectly illustrates the manner in which the entire country has contributed to Hollywood. Wisconsin sent us Don Amici, who started out to study law and became an actor when the leading man in a stock company broke an arm. Don's new 20th Century Fox picture is Hollywood Cavalcade. And recently, for the third successive year, he won the poll conducted by Radio Guide magazine for the best radio actor. This is the same poll in which the Lux Radio Theater was named the best dramatic program. And tonight in Bordertown, we also have the actress who received top honors, Claire Trevor. Miss Trevor's a New York City girl who just completed the universal picture I Stole a Million and tonight plays Mary Rourke. It's hard to say what part of the country Joan Bennett really came from because the Bennett family seldom paused long in any one place. We do know, however, that she was born in New Jersey and inherited her dramatic ability from so many generations of actors that certain humorous historians have asserted that uh, the Bennetts invented the theater. She's here from the Hal Roach studio, where she's starring in The Housekeeper's Daughter, and will now be heard as Dale Elwell, while Don Amici is Johnny Ramirez. We head southward for an exciting dramatic adventure as the Lux Radio Theater presents Border Town, starring Don Amici, Joan Bennett, and Claire Trevor. The Mexican Quarter in the city of Los Angeles. It's a warm spring night. And in the picturesque plaza, swarthy merchants struggle to entice tourists to their native wares. At the edge of the quarter stands a shabby office building. There are lights on the second floor where the graduation exercises are being held in the Pacific Night Law School. The hot room is crowded with students and parents whose faces reveal half a dozen different nationalities. Poverty alone seems to unite them. Poverty and the booming voice of the guest speaker, the Honorable J. Rufus Barnswell, who is just concluding the final oration to the graduates. Your, uh, <clears throat> your applause should be not for me, but for these young men. For such young men as one whose, whose history I happen to know. Who does he mean? It is Johnny. I, uh, I reveal no secret when I say this young man 
was the tough guy of a tough neighborhood. This boy solved his own problem. Toiling at the hardest manual labor by day, he, he studied by night until his courage and ambition brought him to the point at which he now stands. That young man, my friends, is Johnny Ramirez. <laughs> Oh, Mrs. Ramirez, well, he, you should be very proud of Johnny tonight. Oh, I am, Senor George. And excuse me, he was not bad, boy, Excelencio. Only one little bit wild, maybe. Uh, we have party for Johnny now. We poor people, but uh, maybe you come, eh? Yeah, how about it, Your Honor? Well, uh, I, I don't know, Johnny. Uh, uh, Judge Barnes, well, if you're going to make that other appointment tonight, you'd better hurry. Oh, yes, 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 Dave. Well, good night, Mrs. Ramirez. Adios. And, uh, Johnny. Yes? Don't forget, boy, uh, you're not a lawyer yet. There's still a bar examination, you know, and uh, <laughs> they're making them pretty tough these days. Ah, oh, I'm not scared, George. Remember what you said about me? I'm still pretty tough, too. Uh, that's right. Uh, good luck, Johnny. Come on, Dave. Thanks for whew, getting me out of here. You know, this thing sort of got me tonight. Carried away by your own oratory, Judge. You shouldn't be. It's practically the same speech you made at the Sons of Denmark barbecue. Yeah. Just the same. It's, it's rather pathetic, you know. They, they ought to stamp out these quack law schools. Why, it's worse than swindling. What chance have these young foreigners got when college graduates with social position, money, and every possible break are starving to death as lawyers? It's better than starving to death as farmers. I wonder. At least they'd be happy. Why should they be educated to want things that they can't have? Educated into unhappiness. You, you take that Johnny Ramirez chap. Let's take a cab instead. You get me depressed, Judge. Uh, Johnny Ramirez kid I once sent to reform school. <laughs> hey, everybody, quiet, quiet. The padre, the padre has something to tell us. A toast to Johnny Ramirez, no? Long life and success and happiness to our young lawyer and host. Yeah, 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 Johnny! Give a speech. Johnny will make a speech if he wants to make a speech, eh, Johnny? Well, Mama Sita, maybe I do. Thanks, everybody, and all I've got to say is this. There was a lot of talk at graduation tonight about hard work and study. Sure, it was hard. But look at Abraham Lincoln. He worked hard, didn't he? And he study nights, too, just like me. Sure, all right. I, do, uh, I, I did, I mean, just like Lincoln. Oh, no. And I'm going to keep on being like Lincoln, too. Oh, no, Johnny. What? Well, what's the matter with that? Not with whiskers, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> no, no whiskers, Mama Sita, I promise. <laughs> Down, Padre. Oh, so good to see you. Thank you, Mrs. Ramirez. Where is Johnny? <laughs> My fine lawyer. What do you think he do? Come, you look. There is Juanito out in the dirt planting onions. Out in the dirt planting onions. Hey, you lawyer man. Sometimes I think that's where he belongs. Oh, you lawyer man, Juanito. The Padre comes to see you and you plant onions. Padre? Oh, excuse me. I'll, I'll be right in. No, I'll be right out. That is good work, Johnny. I, I should not interrupt. Well, here is my case. If I win it, Padre, a case of onions. It goes slowly, eh? Yeah, doesn't go at all. But I hear you have many clients. Yeah, plenty of clients and no fees. In the last month, I collected $2. You are helping your own people, Johnny. There's a greater satisfaction in that. Oh, it's not the money I care about, Padre, but I, I'm, I'm not getting any place. Your chance will come, Johnny. Patience is one of the virtues of our people. Johnny, uh, Johnny you got to help me. Oh, good day, Padre. Oh, well, you've been hurt. Oh, I just now come from hospital. I come straight to Johnny. Oh, I got mucho trouble, Johnny. Well, what, what happened, Manuel? Oh, this morning I go to market to buy vegetables. I, I go early, you know, three, four o'clock this morning. Oh, Johnny. Uh, I, go on, go on. Well, I, I buy vegetables like every day. I get in my truck to come back. All of a sudden, big, shiny car come around the corner fast like anything, and she's way on the wrong side of the street, Johnny. Well, uh, did it stop? Oh, that's it, Johnny. We both stopped. Bang! My truck, she's all busted up in little pieces. Spinach, tomatoes, everything is all over this street. 
And me too, John. Well, who, who hit you? Did, did you get the license number? A very nice lady. She was driving the car. The, the man's not so nice. I think maybe both have a little too much vino. I say, my poor automobile, what I do? Ladies say, here's some money. Man say, no, give him nothing. Then they go away. Someone take me to hospital. Well, did the man see who they were? Did he get their number? I, I don't know. Oh, Johnny, did the lady give me card? She say I sue her. Well, what she mean, Johnny, sue? Uh, uh, where, where's the card? Where? Uh, here. Here, Johnny, you uh. keep. I don't no want card. I, I want poor old truck. Well, Johnny, Dale Elwell, 2021 Bel Air. Oh, that's a classy section. You fix my truck, Johnny, you good mechanic. I'll fix your truck, Manuel, in a courtroom. And if I don't, then I've wasted five years studying law. Dale Elwell, 2021 Bel Air. Mm. Well, Father, you wanted to see me? You think you can spare me a moment, Dale? Yes. Oh, one of those moments. Yeah, you usually have a snappier answer than that. Oh, you'll have to forgive me. I still have a head from last night. As your mother mentioned something about it. Well, the funniest thing happened last night. Brooke Manville and I were down in Little Mexico. I know all about it. Oh, I get it. Apparently, I've started on the wrong topic. You've started on exactly the right topic. Dale, you're 25 years old. Right now, I'm 125. Now, don't you think it's about time you quit being the wild young thing just out of school, tasting life and freedom for the first time and being, oh, so gay about it all? Oh, Dad, please. All I did was go out with Brooke. We had a good time, and coming home, I ran into some stupid little Mexican's truck. The truck was banged up, I guess, but nobody was hurt, and after all, Brooke's the best lawyer in town, so you say. So what? Only this. That stupid little Mexican was smart enough to get a lawyer. And here, my dear girl, is his telephone number. He's been calling all day. Now, maybe you can settle this out of court, but in any event, I hope you get the licking of your life. Oh, Dale. Dale, don't make me talk to you like this. Good Lord, darling, you, you might have been killed. Oh, I'm sorry, Dad. I just can't seem to, to find myself. You're right. I've got a licking coming to me. Well, I might as well call Brooke first. It'll be fun seeing him take it with me in court. You may continue, Mr. Ramirez. And not only that, Your Honor... But I have also found out that the defendant, Miss Dale Elwell, has had so many automobile accidents that no insurance company will accept her as a risk. I object, Your Honor. Objection sustained, Mr. Manville. Well, can't, can't I, can't I state Mr. Ramirez, the... the court realizes what the counsel is trying to do. Counsel should realize that this is not a law school and that he should not come before it without proper preparation of his case. Okay, Your Honor, then I'll move on to, to another point. At the time of this accident, the defendant had been drinking. In fact, she was probably kind I of... I object. The allegation so presumptuously advanced by my learned opponent is no part of the complaint. Objection sustained. How can I present my case when he keeps objecting? I object. For two hours, you've been objecting to everything I've had to say. Is that your way of being a lawyer, squawking I object like a parrot? I object, if Your Honor, please. Objection sustained. Don't you want to hear the truth? Don't you want to see justice done? Don't you realize that this poor old man's truck was wrecked? Is living taken away by, by a, a spoiled dame who thinks she can get away with the murder just because her old man is rich? What is more important to this court? A lot of legal technicalities or the truth? This court is interested in the truth. But permit me to point out, Mr. Ramirez, that in failing to prepare your case properly, you have failed in your duty to your client. Not only that, but you have been in contempt of court, for which I fine you $25. The court dismisses the case before it because of insufficient evidence. The court will open again at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Clear the courtroom, please. Well, Dale, that's that. You're a free woman again. Thank your lucky stars for a good lawyer. <laughs> and a bad one. Oh, look at him. I feel rather sorry for him, Brooke. He tried so hard. Yeah, I know. It's tough at that. But there's hundreds of them. They go to some half-baked law school, work like dogs, and when they get through... Wait they're... here a minute, Brooke. Oh, Mr. Ramirez. What do you want? Perhaps you won't believe it, but I'd like to help your client get his truck fixed. We didn't come here for pity. Oh, that's not it. You convinced me, you see, even if the judge was stubborn. So please let me... Here, this should cover everything. Oh, that's swell of you after... Well, after I could make you do it. Just a minute, Dale. 
Don't be a fool. If you give him money, you admit responsibility, and he can still bring criminal charges. Would you do that? Of course not. Promise? Sure. As your attorney, Dale, I won't permit it. Don't worry, Brooke. He just said he wouldn't. Dale, what good's a promise from a cheap shyster? He'll be blackmailing you for the rest Listen, of your... Listen, you. You beat me in one kind of fight, but not in this garden. Hey, what do you think you are? Go ahead. Hey, Grab that man. Hey, John, Mandel, are you hurt? No, no, I'm not hurt. Ramirez, this is the last time you'll appear in court except as a defendant. Officer. Yes, sir. Will you be good enough to ask the judge if Mr. Ramirez and I may see him in his chambers immediately? Sure. Come on, you. me out just because I smacked this this big windbag. It's just because you don't want a guy like me who comes from where I do to get a break, that's all. It's not what you are or where you come from. It's you, Ramirez. You're a ruffian at heart. You're cheap, brutal. You'd be that in any country in the world. Is that all? That's all. Except that I'm afraid that your legal career is just about ended. You mean... You mean that they disbar me? I'm afraid so, Mr. Ramirez. Oh, but... Judge, listen, please. All, all I did, all I did was lose my temper. That, that, that won't happen again. I, look, I've, I've worked like a dog. I've studied for, for over five years. Please, please, give me, give me a chance. My, my mother will... Gee, Your Honor, don't, don't you understand? I'm sorry, but when the Grievance Committee of the Bar Association asks my opinion, there's only one thing I can do. Good morning, Mr. Ramirez. But why must you leave, Johnny? Why must you go away from your friends? I've been disbarred, Padre. Disbarred? Yeah. I got a letter today. It'll look nice, hanging next to my diploma. And I... I just came to say goodbye. Oh, I'm sorry for you, Johnny. Where are you going? Oh, I don't know. Down around the border, I guess. Juanito, perhaps you've sought to get ahead in the wrong direction. You mean trying, trying to be a lawyer? I mean putting gain and glory and false ambition above peace of spirit. You're just trying to tell me in a nice way to go back to digging ditches or being a farm laborer like my father. Hmm? Your father was a good man, Johnny. And you're a good man, Padre, a good man. But I'm only a man. And I'm going to take from the world what I want from the world. Oh, patience, Johnny. You may get another chance. You bet you I'll have another chance. But I'll make that chance myself. I'm going to have power, money. You wait. No, Johnny, no. He thought he could insult me, treat me, treat me like a servant, that, that guy Manville. Not because he's a great lawyer, and I'm not. But because his old man's got a million-dollar bankroll. Don't you see, Padre, money, money is what made the difference. And I'm going to get money. Goodbye, Padre. If you can, kind of explain things to my mother. See you, Juanito. Adios. Juanito. Juanito. Hello? See, si, I am the Padre. Who, please? Miss Elwell? No, senorita. Johnny just left. No, I... I do not know where you could find him. He is going away. No. no. He did not say, only maybe to the border. Si, senorita. It is too bad. More than you think it is too bad. just heard Act One of Border Town with Don Amici, Joan Bennett, and Claire Trevor. During this short intermission before Act Two, we bring you the Brownings. The family are at their summer cottage on the lake, and we find Mother Browning and Dot in the kitchen clearing up after breakfast. Dot looks up suddenly. Why, Mother, here comes that young Mrs. Smith from down the road. So early. Wonder what's up. Oh, hello there, Mrs. Smith. We're here in the kitchen. Come right in. Oh, good morning, Mrs. Browning. Dot. Hello. Would you mind awfully if I borrowed some soap? I've run out and I've got a dreadful stack of dishes to do. Why, of course. Dot, uh, give Mrs. Smith a cup full of Lux Flakes. That'll last for days. Goodness, you don't use Lux for your dishes, do you? Oh, yes, always. But isn't it expensive? Oh, not at all. You see, it takes only a tiny bit of Lux to make a lot of suds. Oh, but I, I don't... Oh. <laughs> Here, look. 
I'll pour just a tiny bit of Lux Flakes into the dishpan right now, and you can see for yourself. Now, see all the suds as soon as I turn on the water? My goodness, what a lot of suds. Mm -hmm. Oh, and aren't they lovely? I'd just like to get my hands into mm, them. They feel grand. Lux is real kind to your hands. Well, I'd like to use Lux for my dishes, but... <laughs> And you can for almost nothing. Let me tell you, you can do your dishes for a whole day with about, oh, a penny's worth of Lux. It's silly to bother with slow soaps and harsh soaps that spoil your hands. Good gracious, I should say it is. Well, I'm going to use Lux from now on. Mrs. Browning is right. You need only about a penny's worth of Lux Flakes to do your dishes for a whole day. If the water is hard, a little extra Lux softens it and gives you an abundance of suds. Think of that. A penny a day for your dishes. And think what you're getting. Lux works fast, and it's kind to your hands. Every woman wants pretty hands. There is no harmful alkali in Lux to sting or irritate your skin. So when you buy soap for your kitchen, think of the three advantages you get with Lux Flakes. It's speedy, it's thrifty, and it saves your hands. Buy the generous large size box of Lux Flakes for your dishes and other soap and water tasks. And now, here's Mr. DeMille, ready for Act Two. We continue with Border Town, starring Don Amici as Johnny Ramirez, Joan Bennett as Dale, and Claire Trevor as Mary Rock. A little Mexican town just across the border. It's a busy night at the Silver Slipper, a gambling palace now enjoying a sudden wave of popularity. At one of the tables sits Charlie Rock, the fat and jovial owner of the club. His shrewd eyes survey the crowd, then pause on the figure of his new bouncer, Johnny Ramirez. <laughs> Look at that Johnny work, would you? Day and night, he puts in hours that'll kill a horse. Yeah, what's the matter with him, nuts? Say, that's the smartest kid that ever worked for me. He's busting with ambition. Keeps telling me how he's gonna get rich. Being a bouncer? <laughs> hey, Charlie, hmm? ain't that the missus heading this way? What? Yeah. Well, gee, honey, I didn't expect you here. I'll bet. You look very happy about it, too. Well, uh, I'm tickled to death, only, well, you know, baby, I don't like for you to come to a joint like this. Sure joint, isn't it? Well, sure, but even that don't make it a proper place for a lady like you. Well, I can't stick home all day and night. All the fun I get up there is feeding the goldfish, and they only eat once a day. Oh, now, come on, be a good girl and run along home. I won't be very late. Hey, hey, Johnny. Yeah. Ah, oh, good evening, Mrs. Rock. Hello, Tommy. Hey, Johnny, take the missus to her car, will you? Sure. And you be careful driving, honey. And you be careful lapping up that brew. Hmm? Another couple of pounds, and it'll take a surveyor to measure you for huh? soup. <laughs> That's rich. Did you get that crack, Johnny? <laughs> Ain't she a riot? <laughs> go on, honey, go on. You're killing me. <laughs> yeah, why not? Come on, Johnny. You know, the real reason I came down was to see you. Yeah. You go out the side door over there. You don't seem impressed. So I'm not as impressionable as I used to be. You're a swell-looking kid, Johnny. I I can't go for you. I know. Thanks. Hey, Jose, get Miss Rock's car. She's in your front. Okay, Johnny, if you don't feel like talking, I I can wait. Good night. Hey, Marie. Yes? Nothing. Good night. <laughs> Everybody out, Johnny? Yeah. Heavy take here tonight. Yeah, that's good. Ooh, gee. What's the matter? Ah, it's these teeth of mine again. They're killing me tonight. Now I'm going to run up to L.A. someday and have them all pulled out. That's a good idea. Here, 5,000. That ought to make you feel better. 5,000? Hey, that's great. That's great. I guess I'm a pretty lucky guy, Johnny. Having a girl like Marie for a wife, fixing a swell home for her. Boy, I certainly like a witty dame like her. But not too witty. Huh? Oh, I get it. You mean on account of sometimes she gets lonesome? Well, I'm going to take care of that, too. You know, I got a kind of idea. After I get my choppers yanked out, I'm going to take Marie places, show her things like, uh, like Europe and Paris and things like that. Yeah, she deserves it. Yeah. Want me to ride home with you? Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, you'd better. I'd hate to get knocked over with this kind of dough on me. You ready? Sure. I'll get you. I'll open the garage door for you, Charlie. Open what door? So you don't know nothing, Johnny. Watch this. 
Say, the doors open themselves. Automatic garage, huh? Yeah, yeah, it's the latest gag. You see those posts on each side of the driveway? Yeah. That's but... what they call an electric eye. It opens and closes the door just like it got paid for it. When you walk out of the garage, you pass this here electric eye and it shuts the door again. Uh, that must have cost quite a chunk, huh? Well, sure. Sure it did. But nothing's too good for Charlie Rourke's wife, see? Nothing. Yeah, yeah, Charlie, that's right. Oh, uh, come on in, Johnny. Say hello to the little woman, huh? Hiya, baby. You waiting up, huh? Yeah, surprised again. Oh, Johnny, check this door in the safe, will you? Okay. Say, uh, honey, as long as you're up and Johnny's here, I'll throw you a mess of flapjacks, huh? And boy, can I make them. Can I, Marie? Boy, can you make flapjacks. <laughs> what a day. What a day. <laughs> stick around, Johnny. Yeah, stick around, Johnny. You, you'll probably be here for hours. Bought a lot of new furniture, hmm? Uh-huh. Pretty swell. Oh, it's not so bad. Why not drop over some afternoon for cocktails? Thanks, but I don't drink. Oh, no bad habits at all. None I can't handle. I wonder. How have you been since I saw you last? You mean tonight? Mm-hmm. I'm just the same. I'm just the same, too. Maybe a little more so. Listen, baby. I get this straight. I go for you. I go for you plenty. But Charlie... Oh, Charlie. Being the faithful employee, huh? It ain't because Charlie's my pal. Being pals don't count when there's a dame. Wouldn't I be a prize chump to take a chance of losing my job just when I'm getting ahead, putting putting aside some dough? So it's money. I'm glad you told me. You bet it's money. And it's going to be a lot of money and all that goes with it. Before I'm through, I'll pile up a roll that'll, that'll make them put out the carpet for me in any bank. And if you think I'm going to risk all that, baby, just to hold hands with some good-looking doll, you're crazy. I think I like your eyes best, Johnny, when, you, when you're mad like this. Good night, Mrs. Roy. Uh, like a drink first? Remember? I don't drink. Oh, you seem to be in a big hurry to get out, Johnny. Uh, you're not very complimentary. Mrs. Rourke, that's the best compliment I could pay you. Good night. <laughs> Hey, hey, Johnny. Johnny, come over. You want to see my new teeth again? Oh, uh, I'll look at them later when I got more time to enjoy. Huh? Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> Great boy, huh, Marie? Great. You're glad to see me back, ain't you, baby? How do you like my teeth? Yeah, they're beautiful. <laughs> beautiful, that's right. Hey, hey, Johnny. Johnny, send over a couple of gallons of champagne, will you? We're celebrating tonight on account of my new choppers, huh? <laughs> Oh, I'm tired. I'm sleepy. You're glad to see me, baby. Yeah, i Oh, all right, all right. Guess maybe I don't want no more to drink. Oh, I feel awful. Oh! You fat, stupid lug. Johnny! How's he doing? Well, can't you see? Get your coat. I better drive him home. Oh, uh, just take him to the car. I'll drive myself. Okay, come on. Come on, come on, get up and walk. Uh -huh. I can't carry in the house. Well, oh, you just go ahead, honey. I'll, I'll catch a little snooze here in the garage. Uh, Best garage in town. It cost me over... Uh, Charlie! Huh? Charlie, wake up, will you? Huh? Oh, you run along, baby. You run along. I'll be right in. You just turn off the motor. Uh, Mustn't let the motor run. No, just turn off the motor. Charlie, Charlie, wake up. Uh -huh. Oh, out cold. I ought to leave you here for good. I ought to let the motor run and wash you out, you. Why not? No. Sure, why not? Carbon monoxide poisoning. Suicide. Who'd worry about him? No. No. What good is he to you? What good is he to anybody? Go on, just walk out and leave him. Close the door after you. Go on, why not? Why not? Why not? That's right. Close the door. Close it tight. Go on. Go on, close it.
so much to live in, everything to live for. I'll try to be calm, please, Mrs. Rock. I'm not <laughs> questioning you. This is just a formality the police must observe. Well, it's all been so sudden and terrible. He, he'd been drinking, you There see? are sufficient witnesses to that fact? Yeah, naturally, I couldn't get such a heavy man out of the car. Besides, it, it had happened before, him drinking, I mean, but... But other times he woke up when he got sober and, and came into the house. But this Mrs. time... Mrs. Rogue, please This try time to... he must have woke up still drunk and, and started the car. And... It's all <laughs> quite evident. Accidental death, of course, by carbon monoxide poisoning. We won't trouble you any further, Mrs. Rogue. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Get those tables lined up over here, will you? I want to see how it looks. Oh, hello, Marie. Hello. Your new place all ready for yeah, business? Yeah, sure. Pretty near. Looks swell, huh? Oh, yeah. Lots of luck, Johnny. Oh, thanks, Marie. You've been a big help. I've been meaning to tell you. Oh, forget it. You've been swell taking care of things these last three months since... since Charlie... Marie, what's the use kidding ourselves? You know, I... You what, Johnny? You know what I'm talking about. Nothing to stop me now. Nothing to stop us. You're mine now, Marie. Do you get that? You're mine. Yes, Johnny. Forever. That's a long time. We're going to get married. Because I love you. Because I'll always want you. You won't get tired of me, Johnny. Not as long as I got a bankroll and I got one. I can make my own money. I can help you make more. Johnny! Yeah. Johnny. You win, Marie. Yeah, I wonder how it'll seem being married, hmm? That beautiful place you've got here, Johnny. Glad you like it, Mr. Johnson. Marvelous orchestra, Mr. Ramirez. The name is Johnny, thanks. Makes the old silver slipper look pretty sick. Yeah, well, that old place is pretty good to me. What's this I hear about you and Marie getting married? Oh, maybe, a little later. Hey, Johnny, there's a party out in the foyer. They say they want a table. Tell them to come down next week. Oh, they look the class, a big party. The girl says to tell you the names of Miss Elwell and Mr. Manville. Dale Elwell? Well, I don't know, but she said she knew you. Yeah. Uh, take over here a minute, will you? Hello, Mr. Ramirez. Well, well, a couple of old friends. I forgot to make a reservation. Miss Elwell and Mr. Brooke Manville. We saw your name outside. Yeah, you still want to stay? I suppose we can get a table. Oh, I suppose so, as a special favor to old friends. Hey, Dominique, get that table out of my office. Put it out of, put it out in the corner, will you? See, Johnny. He'll see you. But I like personal service. Come along, Savage. Savage, huh? It's uh, a pity to waste such grand music. Too busy to dance, Johnny? Dale. Take it easy, Counselor. Like dancing, Savage? With you? Sure. Come on. You dance this well with everybody? Well, we just try to please the customers. Oh, so I'm just another customer to you. Oh, no. You know, the last time I saw you, I took a poke at your boyfriend. That threw me into this business where I'm making plenty of dough. And now I see you on the opening night of my place. What you are is good luck. Better not lose track of me, then. No, I'm not going to. No more. <laughs> hey, Johnny. Yeah, what? Mrs. Walk is here. She's pretty mad. Okay, okay. Uh, uh Miss Alwell, I, I got something to attend to. Uh, excuse me, will you? If you promise me another dance. And she afraid you'll make his honor jealous? Not a bit. I'll be back. Dale, Dale, come and sit down, will you? Amusing, isn't it? That type of thug may not be so amusing if he gets serious. I imagine he could be a little dangerous. If he couldn't, he's going to be an awful disappointment to me. Hello, Marie. I thought you were going to call for me. What's the idea? Keep me waiting for two hours. Well, if you want the truth, I've been so busy with everything, I forgot. Oh, so you forgot. You didn't forget to make a play for that dame. I saw you dancing. Yeah? Well, stay around, baby. You'll see me dancing some more right now. Johnny! Hang around, Marie. I'll see you later. I don't see how you could have accomplished all this, Johnny, in such a short time. Just lucky. No. I imagine you get what you go after. Most of the time. I'll bet your wife is proud of you. I'm not married. What? A handsome, successful young man like you not grabbed off yet? Say, look, quit riding me, will you? I'm not riding you. Don't be so self-conscious. You know, I've uh, never been this way before. You, you make me feel kind of, kind of dumb. Your only trouble, Johnny, is that you don't know how to play. You work too hard. Well, I guess I could learn. Like me to teach you? Sure, I would. 
All right. First, you have to relax. It's a lovely night. There's a moon, soft music. This is really romantic, my boy. Drink it in, enjoy it. Hey, you're... You're swell. Of course I am, and we're going to have fun together. What's out there? That's a party, oh. Let's, uh... Why not? Come on, Johnny. <laughs> See? You're improving already. Now, don't you feel nice and calm? No. Stoop down a little, and I'll tell you a secret. Neither do I. Dale, I... I... Uh... Take it easy. We've got company. We got... Oh. Oh, hello. Hello, Marie. Uh, meet Miss Alwell. This is Mrs. Rourke. How do you do, Miss Alwell? So pleased, Mrs. Rourke. Lovely patio, isn't it? Yeah, I'm glad you like it. Johnny and I planned it for so long. We're really tickled to death with everything. Oh, we? Marie, What's you... What's the be... matter, Johnny? Haven't you told Miss Alwell? Yeah, you see, Johnny and I have been sort of... Well, uh, partners for a long time. He does most of the work, and I put up most of the money. That seems fair enough. Yeah, it's worked out very pleasantly so far, in every way. That reminds me, Marie. I've got some business to talk over with you right now. Oh, I didn't mean to break up your little chat. Come on, in the office. What are you trying to do, make a sap out of me? You do all right without my help. Sneaking down there and spying on me. All right, so I'm spying on you. One look at her and one look at you, and I've got the whole setup. up. Calling in when I'm talking to a lady. Well, look what wants to talk to ladies. Looks what thinks he's a gentleman. You're a barroom bouncer, and you'll always be one. All right, Marie. That's enough. If it wasn't for me, you'd still be rolling the drunk side of the silver slipper. I made you rich. I put those swell clothes on your back. And now, just because you got your neck washed, you think you're a gent. Well, nobody can make you that. You're riffraff, you and I. You belong with me, and you'll stay with me. Get that, you'll stay with me. No, I won't, Marie. I found out what I want, and I'm taking it. She has any right up. to you. You belong to me. I'm holding on to you. I did a lot of things to get you, Johnny. I... I even committed murder. You... You what? Sure. Sure, I killed him. I killed him to get you. You killed Johnny? Why? Makes me sick to even look at you. Johnny, where are you going? I want to get away from you, that's all. I don't care where I go, just so I don't have to see or... or look at you. You're rotten. Johnny! Get me the police station. You heard me, I said the police station. Hello, this is Mrs. Rock speaking. Is the commissioner there? We'll tell him to wait. I'm coming right down. Yes, now. Just a minute, senora. Don't understand. He made me kill him. He said he'd kill me if I didn't. I was afraid of him. I had to do it. I... Johnny wanted the money he knew I'd get. Are you willing to sign a confession to the effect... Yes. Yes, I'll sign anything. To the effect that Johnny Ramirez forced you to kill your husband? Yes, I tell you. Yes. Hernandez, si. get Johnny Ramirez. Make out a warrant. Murder. <laughs> Pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. That was Act Two of Border Town, starring Don Amici, Joan Bennett, and Claire Trevor. During this short intermission, we present an internationally famous guest. But first, I want to demonstrate something. I have here a metronome, the kind people use when they practice on the piano. Listen to it now. Now listen to it. Quite a lot faster, isn't it? In fact, it's four times as fast. And that's the difference between Lux Flakes and a cake of soap in your dishpan. Lux dissolves four times as fast. Cake soaps are so slow. Remember, until a soap goes into suds, it can't clean at all. It seems foolish, doesn't it, to wash dishes such an old-fashioned way, especially when you can use Lux for all your dishwashing so inexpensively. And think of this. Lux flakes are as gentle to your hands as the finest toilet soap. A little Lux goes so far and makes such wonderful suds that it's truly thrifty. Better start using Lux for your breakfast dishes tomorrow morning. Remember, it's speedy, it's safe, and it saves your hands. 
Here's Mr. DeMille. Tomorrow is the 4th of July, and it's a remarkable 4th. For it was just a few weeks ago that we welcomed joyfully the visit of the monarchs of that country of which we declared our independence 163 years ago. I've asked as our guest of the evening, Mr. H.V. Kaltenborn, who during the last ten eventful years has reported to the people of this continent the happenings of the world over the Columbia Network. Three years ago, he was the first man to broadcast from a battlefield when he carried his microphone to a haystack in Spain and described the battle raging about him. Last September, his reporting of the European crisis became a journalistic classic. Because of Mr. Coltonborn's worldwide experience and vision, he's particularly well qualified to bring home to us the significance of tomorrow's anniversary. The Lux Radio Theater welcomes H.V. Coltonborn, speaking from New York City. Good evening, everybody. The play to which we are listening reminds us that people from border towns all over the world have found a home in America. And tomorrow, their sons and daughters here in their land of adoption will join in celebrating our common heritage of freedom. The 4th of July is the birthday of the United States. It is a happy custom to celebrate birthdays with gifts to the celebrant. Let us therefore pause for a moment and ask ourselves, what gift can I make to my country? What does it need that I can supply? How can I express my thanks for what it gives to me? Surely, every American citizen is now conscious of certain blessings which he enjoys. In Europe, Asia, and Africa, war and rumors of war abound. Throughout most of Europe, national energies are concentrated almost exclusively on preparation for war. The fine arts, the pursuit of knowledge, science, literature, recreation, even religion are subordinated to the state's demand for fighting men and war machines. We, too, are preparing, but here we are still able to spare time and money for those things that give value and meaning to human life. We can afford leisure to enjoy radio plays and outdoor sports. We have no military conscription, and we are happy to remember that with our good neighbor Canada, we possess the world's longest unfortified frontier. In one year, 1939, we can have two successful world's fairs on our Atlantic and Pacific shores. Best of all, we can still afford the priceless luxury of freedom. We are still strong enough to grant freedom even to those who would use it only to destroy it. But we must be on our guard. There are those among us who despise liberty even as they use it to achieve their foul ends. Let us mark these men and know them for what they are. They are easily recognized. In a land of religious freedom, they attack freedom for a religion they dislike. In a land of racial tolerance, they are intolerant of every race to which they do not belong. In a land of free speech, they would mob and silence those with whom they disagree. Their number is small, but an easygoing, generous people sometimes permits a rabbit minority to assume great power. Let us resolve, therefore, on the birthday of American freedom to conserve that freedom. Each one of us can bring a precious birthday gift to the altar of our country. Whenever and wherever you hear men preach hatred or intolerance, Speak out against it. Remember, silence gives consent. It is the right, nay, it is the duty of every American to speak out boldly for the ideals of human freedom whenever and wherever they are challenged. By so doing, we of the new world will keep alight the torch of liberty in the troubled days that lie ahead. We will remember your words, Mr. Kaltenborn, and our freedom here will never know a compromise. In Hollywood again, Don Amici, Joan Bennett, and Claire Trevor continue in Act Three of Border Town. It's three weeks later. Arrested for the murder of Charles Rock, 
Johnny's in the Mexican jail, calmly awaiting trial. He's just finishing a letter to Dale Elwell. Something seems to puzzle him, and he calls a guard. Hey, Pedro. See, Johnny? Is it uh, okay to say yours sincerely when, uh, when you're writing a letter to a lady? I don't write much letter, Johnny. You're much smarter than I. Yeah, I guess you're right. I say so. Don't worry. I'll be out of this and up to see you pretty quick now. Yours sincerely. Now, uh, just Johnny Edson. Yeah, you ride fast, Johnny, all right. Uh, here, here, mail this for me right away. Yeah. Hey, Johnny, Johnny, you got a visitor. Visitor? Uh, uh, American girl? Dark? Young? Uh, very beautiful? All I know is you got a visitor. Okay, come in. Juanito. Oh, mamacita. How, how, how'd you get down here? Oh, Johnny, you no, do not do this. No, 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 I don't kill anybody, mamacita. You see? That's what I say. Sometimes he bad, but never my Juanito tell lies. Oh, I bad right now. <laughs> it makes you cry and, and then gets your nose red. Tell me, tell me, how, how's the Padre and old Manuel? Oh, I haven't seen them in... Johnny, it... you, you no worry? Me worry about what? Oh, come on, come on now. No more crying. I got a good lawyer. <laughs> That's funny, huh? And when I get up at the trial and that... Put your honor. Quiet please. in the court. The prosecuting attorney will continue. And so, your honor, and gentlemen of the jury, the prosecution will prove that Ramirez, by reason of duress and threats, employed this woman, the wife of the murdered man, as ruthlessly as ever a man employed dagger or gun to commit for profit. A brutal, cold blooded, preconceived murder. Now, with your honor's permission, I call my first witness, Mary Rock. Mrs. Rock, just how long before the death of Charles Rock were you acquainted with the defendant, Johnny Ramirez? Well? Uh, eight months. Where did you first meet him? Is there anything wrong? I repeat, Mrs. Rock, where did you first meet the defendant? <laughs> You will answer the question, please. <laughs> he had so much to live for. I see him. I see him now. He's laughing at me. Every night I've seen him. He tells everybody what I did. No one will let me alone. They stare at me. No! No, no! I did it! I killed him! He was fat! <laughs> fat like a pig! Dead! <laughs> dead! Dead! Your Honor! The attorney Your Honor, I moved to dismiss this case on the ground that the sole witness for the prosecution, Marie Rourke, is obviously insane. Yes, sir? Johnny Ramirez is the name. Yes, Mr. Ramirez. Now, you've got to memorize. Go tell it to Miss Elwell. Sorry, sir. Miss Elwell is not in. I'm sorry, too, but I don't believe it. Go in and tell her I'm here. Uh, no, no, don't bother. I'll tell her so myself. Yes, but... Uh, Hi, uh... you? Hiya, Dale G. You look swell. Johnny, I, I'm so glad to see I you. I just came up from the border. Oh, gee, I've been thinking of you plenty. They gave you a pretty bad time, didn't they? No, oh, the only tough thing about it was that I, I had to break that date with you. Oh, I, I wanted to come down to the trial, but my family... Sure, sure, forget it. Uh, here, I brought you something. Oh, thank you. Johnny, what a beautiful corsage. Corsage, my hat, that's a genuine orchid. Come on, pin it on. Let's get going, huh? What? We're celebrating, Dale, and believe me, have I looked forward to this. <laughs> oh, Johnny, I, I'm so sorry. I was just leaving. Sure, with me. Well, really, I can't. I'm on my way to a dinner party. Oh, well, uh, uh, cut me in, and then we'll sneak out early, huh? Oh, I, I couldn't do that. It's one of those very stiff and formal affairs. Older people, friends of the family. Oh, all right. Uh, listen, I'll, I'll take you there. Hmm? Well, so far, Johnny, it's way past Malibu. Yeah, well, the farther the better. Okay, but we better get started. Come on, Johnny, step on it. I'm nearly an hour late already. And you're going to be later, because here's where we stop. Johnny, I'm not fooling now. I must get to that party. I know, I know, but what I got to say is more important than the dinner party. Honest, it is. All right, what? I love you. Oh, that's very sweet of you, dear. When I first saw you that day in court, I... I wouldn't have had the right to say it. I was busted. I didn't amount to nothing. And now I've got dough. 
Lots of it, and, and plans to make more. All the work and everything was worth it, just to be able to tell you this. That's a lovely compliment. Your class. Real class. Something a guy can love and, and respect. And I do, Dale. I want to marry you. Johnny, you're being romantic, and that's out of character. Listen, I'm serious. You can't be. Why, marriage isn't for us even to talk about. It's for me to talk about. I love you. I'm asking you to marry me. That's out of the question, Johnny. You must understand that. No, I don't understand. Why? Because you belong to a different tribe, Savage. A different tribe, huh? You mean... I mean there's such a thing as equality. Now, please, don't be annoying. Equality? Why didn't you say that the first time I kissed you? You treated me plenty like an equal end. You made a play for me, and because I thought you was decent and swell, I... I believed it meant you loved me. Let go of me, Johnny. Johnny! Oh, I can't hurt you. You you can't feel nothing except some ten-cent thrill that, that, that gives you a kick. And after you have your kick, you think you can wash yourself up by saying you're better than other people. But I'm Johnny Ramirez, see, and that stuff don't go with me. Let go of me, you filthy brute. Let well, go. I, I'll let go, but I... Dale, come back. Come back here, come back. Dale, Dale, I, I won't hurt you. There, there's a car coming. For God's sakes, look out! Dale! 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 You may see him now, Mrs. Ramirez. Remember, only a moment. See, Doctor. Juanito. Oh, hello, hello, Mama. Juanito, how do you feel? Oh, no, not, not so good. How is, so is she, Dale, the girl? Oh, she, she's fine, gracias. She, she wasn't hurt? No. She says you, you save her. Uh. <laughs> You always, always cry when you see me, Mama. That is no good. Oh, I, I cannot speak so good, Johnny. My eyes speak for me. I've been, been a pretty bad son, Mama. Oh, no, no, Juanito, no, no. You're scared I'm going to die, huh? No, no. You forget what the judge said when, when they made me a lawyer. The toughest kid in the neighborhood. I'm pretty tough yet, Mama. Pretty tough. Mrs. Ramirez, I think... See, see, I... I go now, Juanito. You know, dear God, I don't remember my... my prayers very well. I've been no good. But it's all right. Now I know what's wrong. She was right, God. A different tribe. God help me. Johnny Ramirez needs help. Not much, but but a little. I don't want money no more. From now on, all I want is to be happy. I think I know what that means. Johnny. Dale. Every time you see me, I make a bigger fool of myself. Me praying. Oh, Johnny. I didn't think you, you knew how to cry. Neither did I. Thank you for teaching me, Johnny. You're not mad at me? No, Johnny. I'm not mad. You forgive me? Oh, yes, yes. If there was anything to forgive you for, I'm the one... Look. Look, Dale. You marry that Manville guy. He's okay. If he'll have me. You'll come to my opening? You and him together? Another one, Johnny. Oh, much... Much better place, Dale. Much bigger, too. Five hundred thousand acres. Yes, Johnny. You need new, new clothes for this one. 
Overalls. Overalls? Yes. My father was a farmer. He was a pretty good farmer. Maybe I'll be a pretty good farmer, too. We have just heard the last act of Border Town with Don Amici, John Bennett, and Claire Trevor. In a moment, our stars return to their curtain calls. But first, I'd like to remind you that in the summertime, more than ever, people notice your hands. If they're rough and red, they show up terribly with light-colored summer dresses and short sleeves. They wreck the looks of your costume and cause you embarrassing moments. Now, summer hands are busy hands, and they need special help. Help in the dishpan, for instance. The kind of help you get with Lux Flakes. You wouldn't dream of washing your hands with a harsh kitchen soap, would you? Then why plunge your hands three times a day into a dishpan full of strong suds that sting and bite your skin? That's foolish, when Lux Flakes are so gentle, as gentle as the finest toilet soap. They help your hands stay soft and smooth. Lux has none of the harmful alkali found in harsh soaps. And you need only about a penny's worth to do your dishes for a whole day. In hard water, a little extra Lux softens the water and gives an abundance of suds. Just remember, Lux is kind to your hands and kind to your pocketbook. Ask for the large size box of Lux Flakes for extra economy. And now, Mr. DeMille with our stars. We ended our play with Johnny Ramirez crossing the border from the land of disillusion into the Valley of Truth. And I want to ask Don Amici, Joan Bennett, and Claire Trevor, just what moral do you draw from Border Town? Well, this, Mr. DeMille. You can't be happy unless you found the thing you really want to do for a living. That goes for mm. cowboys, farmers, and chemists. Is that right, Joan? Actors, too. Mm, I think it's especially true of actors. Was there ever a really good actor or actress who didn't like the work? Oh, some actors like acting so much they do it on their own time, too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it that much. It's the pleasantest sort of work, though, if you like work. And despite all the jokes about it, I think everyone does. Don't you, Claire? Of course. But getting back to that moral of Don's about happiness coming through finding the thing you want to do, isn't it usually by pure accident that you find the right thing? Well, it certainly was with me. When I went to college, the man who made out my registration papers for no reason at all put me down as a law student, so I just let it pass. See, I might have been a lawyer through accident, <laughs> except for another accident that made me, uh, well, whatever it is I am. <laughs> What kind of an accident made you an actress, Joan? Well, it's never very accidental for a Bennett to get mixed up with acting. Once many years ago, there was a Bennett who quite accidentally did not become an actor. What about you, Claire? Well, a friend of mine went to dramatic school instead of college, so I did too. It was probably an accident that anybody ever hired me. Well, that takes care of us all except uh, Mr. DeMille. <laughs> well, it was just 26 years ago this summer that I had lunch in New York with two young men who, like myself, were almost broke. Their names were Jesse Lasky and Sam Goldwyn. We added up what money we had and decided to make a motion picture. And we made it, about a stone's throw from this stage. And as I understand it, that was the accident that started Hollywood. Well, C.V., it's been a very pleasant evening. Thanks a lot. Yes, thank Good you. Night. Good, Good night. night. Be careful crossing the street. Don Amici appeared through courtesy of Chasen Sandberg. Louis Silvers is from 20th Century Fox Studio, where he directed music for Second Fiddle. Claire Trevor stars in the radio series Big Town. Her next picture is RKO's Allegheny Frontier. The superb artist who gave such unforgettable performances in Mutiny on the Bounty and the Private Life of Henry VIII stars on this stage a week from tonight, Mr. Charles Lawton. He's going to repeat for us one of his greatest characterizations, the title role in Ruggles of Red Gap. This gusty American classic is the romance comedy of a gentleman's gentleman, of his bewildered journey to the Wild West and his ultimate conquest of the town of Red Gap. And with Mr. Lawton, you'll hear two other stars from the original picture cast, Mr. Charles Ruggles and Miss Zazu Pitts. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Charles Lawton in Ruggles of Red Gap with Zazu Pitts and Charles Ruggles. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>